uh, industry attention in terms of development of product research and so on and so forth okay so much of the attention is in the last uh, uh, 10 or 15 years okay this again is number of publications you know resulting all the all over the world is uh, obtained uh, two, like uh, two years ago anyway uh, uh, so it's 2014 rather than 2016 so you know, there were almost like 600, 700 publications coming from all over the world, okay, which started, you know, in 1995, there were hardly one or two publications, you know, getting in this particular area. So, that shows academic research intensifying, you know, in terms of the high pressure processing application. And I, I already showed you some of these uh, world cloud in the uh, yesterday, okay, this shows uh, the application in terms of uh, what high pressure is being used for okay as a main replacement for thermal processing i think that's a, that's the main use of high pressure processing and we also have uh, yeah application for antioxidant retention enzyme inactivation and you know drying and uh, pasteurization of juice and other things so these are basically keywords that were used to highlight you know the intended area you know of application for high pressure processing and uh, this you already saw, you know, the, the different countries in the world where high pressure processing is a is a high high uh, high profile priority. Uh, this shows the top 15 universities or institutions which are engaged in high process high pressure processing research. CISC in Spain is probably the leading institution in terms of high pressure processing, you know, applications. And uh, Belgium is very big. China Agricultural University, they, all, they only started five years ago, but they have been publishing a lot of papers. Okay? There is a very big team of researchers there. Okay? Washington State University, Ohio State University, these were the pioneers uh, for high pressure processing in the US. Okay? They, they have not been doing a lot of research these days, but they are the first ones to actually start everything. You also see McGill University. In McGill University, in, uh, in Canada, McGill University is probably the only university engaged in high pressure processing research until maybe 3 4 years ago now there are other universities involved you know uh, in high pressure processing research india is not here because uh, it's not in the top you know 15 you know institutions in the world okay so even the bottom one here has uh, more than 60 you know publications you know uh, in the high pressure processing area and this you already saw before okay so uh, how does high pressure processing work? Okay, there are uh, uh, a, a few principles. One is called a physical principle, which is called isostatic principle, based on pressure itself. Okay, so as I mentioned before, the application of pressure is instantaneous and uniform. Okay, this is a very very important consideration for success of the high pressure processing. The second one is the chemical principle, which is called Le Chatelier's principle. Here it says states that any reaction, uh, you know, you all know, all reactions results in a, a volume change. Okay, reaction volume. It's not the real volume; it's a reaction volume change. Okay, and anything that deals with volume change is going to be influenced by the application of pressure. Okay, if the volume change results in a decrease in volume, then those are accelerated by high pressure. If the volume of reaction is positive and it increases those reactions are going to be suppressed by the application of high pressure okay so it it uh, accelerates certain type of reactions it suppresses certain other type of reactions okay so that's the chemical principle the third one is what i call molecular ordering okay so higher temperature is always effective you know for inactivation of enzymes and microorganism why higher temperature as your temperature goes up the kinetic energy associated with the molecules increases you know the, the, act, the it will be in more active form it it crosses the activation energy and then initiates the reaction okay so basically it's all kinetic theory in terms of making things happen okay just like temperature if you have higher pressure it also increases the kinetic energy so temperature and pressure acts in a synergistic manner in this in this aspect okay so they have synergy combination therefore is more effective in terms of accelerating certain reaction rate kinetic later on i'm going to point out one it also have antagonistic activity okay that will stop we'll look at that little later okay the high pressure processing has been shown 
to mostly affect the biomolecule okay like starches anything that has uh, you know starches protein and other macromolecules the small molecules like you know uh, uh, nutrients okay biotin thiamine ascorbic acid these are not going to be influenced by high pressure because they are all covalently bound any covalent bond is not affected you know hydrogen bond you know the the secondary tertiary bonds that are associated with macromolecules like starches and protein they are affected okay so therefore you know it can be used for inactivating enzymes because enzymes are proteins it can be used for inactivating microorganisms because dna and other things are denatured and uh, it also can influence many of the functional properties because we know with starch starch can be gelatinized one once you know gelatinized starch has a different behavior as compared to ungelatinized starch same way proteins before denaturation and after denaturation they are very different okay and high pressure can denature can de gelatinize therefore they can affect the functional properties okay whereas the uh, uh, nutritional quality is not affected because the covalent bonds are not affected in some cases color and texture can be affected if these are associated with the protein or starch molecule you know for example meat most of the color is associated with the myoglobin which is a protein and protein when once it get denatured the color also gets changed so high pressure protein pretty much destroys the red color of meat so red meat is one of the cases where high pressure processing is not good okay for all other things is very good but preservation of red color in meat products or even in fish product like salmon or tuna and others is not good it could take the cooked appearance it's not cooked it still stays raw but it looks like it's cooked okay because the protein is denatured okay so that's one of the problems that is associated with the high pressure you know processing so it can result in cell wall or tissue rupture okay it's like a, it's a very high pressure okay it's a mechanical stress and then you suddenly release the pressure it can break the cell okay it's like uh, uh, i have seen some movies you know old uh, james bond movies or whatever you know the bad guys want to punish somebody they put them you know in a, in a chamber put a very very high pressure okay and then suddenly release the pressure and the person inside there simply explodes okay because of the sudden you know expansion okay so something like that happens here also with cellular material with microbial especially vegetative cell microbial spores are very tight and compact they are not easily disrupted but vegetative bacteria can easily be you know ruptured as a result of quick release of the pressure and it it offers in executes very high mechanical stress nobody likes stress okay if you are under stress okay let's say something ba happening back home okay you know your mind is always looking at there okay what's happening there you are under stress you know try to see what can be done here you may be sitting here listening to me nothing of what i say really goes into your into your head okay so you lose your concentration you lose your ability to properly think under stress okay every year after the exam i see three or four students always coming to my office sir i didn't do very well because that happened this happened i couldn't sleep you know i was sick my family was sick something other under pressure they cannot think properly they cannot write properly they cannot express properly it every one of us have experienced this kind of thing the pressure that we are talking about here is super super high pressure okay much much no more than what we can really think of so basically microorganisms simply quit working okay they just give up and they die okay so because of the extremely high mechanical stress okay as i already said it doesn't affect covalent bond so it's good for us okay and then functional properties are in fact affected so principal application areas are for pasteurization which is uh, basically inactivation of vegetative pathogens you know and small spoilage uh, vegetative bacteria no spores okay no spore kill okay so pasteurization can be done very easily with high pressure even at low temperature it can be done and a variety of juices milk meat and a variety of products are subjected to pasteurization just to make them safe and then you refrigerate it and then sell them okay it can also be used for sterilization by properly modifying you can use it for spore destruction but at room temperature if you try to put pressure no matter how high you go whether it's 9 700 900 or even 
like the machine that you have, you cannot kill spore. Okay. First, the spore coat, which is very strong, has to be softened. In order to do that, either you can use some chemicals or you can elevate the temperature to maybe 80 degrees, 90 degrees when the spore coat is softened. And once it is softened, then high pressure can affect. Okay. So, it requires both temperature and pressure like in normal sterilization. Only advantage here is you do not need to keep it that long. Okay. Normal pressure, pasteurization or sterilization in canning, it takes a long time. Here, everything can be done in 5 minutes. Okay. So, that is the advantage. Therefore, even though it requires high temperature and short time, it, it, the quality of the product coming out is extremely good. Okay, and it can also be used for modifying the texture like you can make gels, you can make uh, 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 many other you know transformations you know gel sol you know like solid to liquid to solid, semi solid and other transformations with uh, fish, egg, many proteins, starches etcetera. You can develop functional properties okay. like I mentioned about one of the viscosity modifying example that I, I gave you yesterday you can do that here. You can use this to fabricate particles of different size, shape, you know, by simply inducing functional properties. And it can also use, be used for uh, uh, imparting functional changes in many products like cheese. You can use high pressure for accelerating the ripening of cheese. Okay, cheese has to be ripened in order to get the appropriate flavor. And high pressure treatment can actually accelerate that. So, it can be used for many of that type of application. Surimi, surimi is a fish gel. Okay. So, basically used from waste you know like a byproduct of fish and you can make gel, you can make frankfurters, you can make hamburgers. All those things can be done with the application of pressure. And you can also affect many of the, the phase change processes like freezing, thawing, they both involve change of phase. And since high pressure can affect the freezing point, all these processes can be influenced. Again, we can take advantage of that in some special situation. We will see that in a minute. Okay. These are all some examples of commercial products that have been introduced into the market. The very first one is probably the Avomax from USA, which was introduced mostly for the Mexican market. You know, the guacamole is a very, very classical avocado puree, very, very popular in Mexico and most of the western United States. Okay. And that has a very powerful enzyme polyphenol oxidase. And if you do not inactivate that, the green color becomes dull. Okay. So, if you, if you make heat, if you add heat to inactivate the enzyme like the blanching that we do, that also affects the color. Okay. But if you use high pressure processing for that, there is no change in color, enzyme gets inactivated and you can make the puree and you can store it under frozen condition you can have extended storage life. Okay. This was the first application in fact commercial application and it also in Japan it has been originally used for jams. This Japan was the first country actually to introduce this into the market. Okay. Jams, jellies, you know fruit syrups etcetera, uh, fruit juices etcetera and uh, in Europe also it has been used in meat. Uh, in Spain it has been also used for decontamination of meat okay. especially you know after handling there can be some cross contamination that can be eliminated with high pressure processing. Uh, another very important application is for oysters. Oysters, oysters have a problem with uh, vibrio okay, which is has to be inactivated by heat. Okay. Secondly, you have to you have to shuck the shells in order to take you know uh, take the meat out of it. Okay. So, normally you boil the oysters for some time take it out and you break it and you take the scoop it out. Okay, with high pressure processing, when you do that, the, the shell is almost separated. Okay. So, you know, with a very simple folding, you know, opening, you can open up and the meat is clearly separated due to the application of pressure. So, you just scoop it out or you just pour it to, you know, a spoon and you can use it. Okay. It is a very, very, very interesting application as you can see here. It comes out like that, very easy and, uh, you know, and safe. Okay, so, that is another big you know application for high pressure. Uh, it has been used for rice, you know China they like sticky rice and here in India we like grainy rice. You can use the same high pressure processing in different ways 
by modifying the surface properties either to make them more sticky or to make them less sticky. You know, we keep rice for curing for six months, old rice we say, right? Old rice is good for making grainy rice. So, you do not have to wait that long. You can use high pressure processing to facilitate ripening or you know curing of rice to make it more grainy. Okay? So, again that is possible. So, fruit syrups, you know, fruit juices, you know, uh, fruit pieces, etcetera, very easy. Okay? So, more examples here, again meat here, uh, this is again same repeated there. Okay? So, there are many, many examples like that. I just showed you some of them, you know, which can be used, you know, uh, uh, processed by high pressure processing application. So, here you see many companies producing high pressure processing equipment. This SEB is in France, Abjur Technologies that is the very first one who actually got all the clearance from the regulatory people FDA for high pressure processing. Okay? They are in the US. Uh, Bato Kefa that is the Chinese one, okay? although they started very recently, they are expanding very, very quickly. You know, they have been using this type of machine for treating brown rice. Okay? You know, there is such a volume and then nobody thought that people will be using high pressure processing for treatment of rice. Okay? So, they have introduced this in many industry, you know, industrial unit. Uh, Kobelco is in Japan, high pressure dynamics uh, is in US, Elmhurst is in US and uh, NC Hyperbaric is in Spain, Stanford in UK, I think the machine you have, uh, UHTE is the uh, uh, Netherlands and this is Germany and EPS in uh, I think US or Europe, the head office I am not sure, but they sell quite a bit in, in, uh, in the US. So, worldwide there are many, many companies now who have put infrastructure for manufacturing high pressure processing equipment. That is why you know they are in fact these people are promoting in you know industry to take up the facility because these are very expensive okay when they put so much investment in terms of machinery they need to sell the machine okay so they need to demonstrate you know they become the salesperson for for uh, the product as well because only when the product sells you know the the equipment sells okay so therefore uh, it's been you know uh, it's been you know company driven at McGill University, we have a very, very nice uh, pilot plant uh, for high pressure processing. In most, most universities, most institutions, they will they have like one unit of high pressure processing, whereas we have several units for different purposes. Okay? We have one unit that goes up to 900 megapascals and 135 degrees centigrade. This we can use for sterilization application. And we have a semi continuous unit at 650 megapascals. It can be used for pasteurization applications, both for packaged products and for, you know, open product. I think you were asking something yesterday. Yeah, it can be used for directly filling the chamber with juices, and then it, the operation is still batch, but it's semi-continuous. You don't need to open the lid. Okay, you process it and push the liquid, just like uh, you know, aseptic processing. You, you heat it, push the uh, processed product into one and fill it up with the new product okay, in a semi continuous fashion. And we also have a kinetic unit uh, uh, from France which goes up to 700 megapascals and it can be very well temperature controlled. These are only mini cells, okay, small, small like 5 milliliter cells, there are 5 of them in a row. Okay. So, for kinetic work it is very, very uh, good. Uh, I have a freezing unit which is jacketed with a refrigerant, so I can do freezing, thawing, transformation under high pressure processing conditions. And I also have an electro hydrodynamic pressure pulsing apparatus where we discharge very high voltage current into water and we actually create a tsunami. Tsunami releases a lot of pressure. Okay? So, and that can be done at several cycles per second. There are many studies where multiple pulses have been used, but these are all full cycles, each cycle taking you know 5 minutes in order to process it. Whereas, this one I can give 12 pulses in 1 second. It is like a pulsed, pulsed, it's like pulsed light, you know, uh, uh, pulsed electric field, you can have pulsed, you know, pressure in there. Okay, so, uh, this is one of the very most uh, unique and versatile complete set of high pressure processing, you know, system in the entire North America. No other university, no other institute has all these things in one place. And uh, 
so we have complete the lab is complete with microbiology quality functionality and all that it is actually a 2 million dollar facility about 6 7 years ago and that came through Canada foundation for innovation. Okay, this is a picture of that. Okay, this is the 650 megapascal semi-continuous unit here. It's a control system here, and uh, for both, like this is one control for here, another control there for the other equipment, which goes up to 900 megapascal. This is the old ABB system that I had. Okay, it's a three liter. It only goes up to 400 megapascal. Everything is manual, but these things are all very very automatic. Okay, so this shows the 900 megapascal unit. Because under 900 megapascal, when you are doing for sterilization, temperature is very critical. You need to measure the temperature of the product, not just temperature of the liquid. Okay? Temperature of the liquid is easy. Most units will have a, a thermocouple attached. You can measure the temperature. But to measure the temperature of the product inside there is, is difficult. You need to have special thermocouples going in there. So this type of work needs that temperature. So therefore. You know, you know, you have to assemble all the thermocouples into the chamber. Okay, so you need to lift the lid up and put all these things, and then insert it back. That's why, therefore, you have this uh, electrical, you know, fork lift in order to do all those things. And this is the uh, hydrodynamic pressure pulsing. This this generates a high voltage, you know, uh, oscillating uh, current, and that's the discharge. Okay, you have a small chamber and two electrodes where this high voltage current is discharged into there and it creates a boom like a bomb okay, with a pretty heavy sound okay, and that creates instantaneous pressure. This is very effective especially just like a, a pneumatic hammer. Okay. If you are breaking a road, how do they do? They just do not go like this. They keep going like that. Okay. So, that breaks things much faster and therefore more effective in terms of killing effect. Okay. And it can be very easily used for tenderizing meat you know the electrical stimulation that normally you use, you can replace that with this uh, hydrodynamic pressure pulsing equipment. And that is the kinetic unit which have you know all these uh, small chambers here like one, two, there are five of them there, each of them with a separate control for pressure and temperature. Okay, So, wonderful thing for, uh, for doing kinetic studies. Okay, so, uh, we have done a lot of work in this area, but anytime when you want to do a process development for a new product, you have to go through the whole works in a very systematic way. Okay? So, you need to know first of all how the enzymes are inactivated, you should determine the enzyme kinetic, spoilage bacterial kinetic, you know pathogenic bacterial kinetic and also how the quality is changing with different application time, pressure, temperature etcetera. And then based on all these things you can select a criteria okay i'm going to do this for five log reduction of this particular microorganism okay you set something like that and then you develop your process what conditions will give that destruction okay that's your establishment of the of the process and then you have to verify whether really is it giving if you set up for five log reduction is it achieving five log or is it achieving only 4 log or maybe 8 log. So, verification step again is important. Okay? And then with microorganism there is one other risk. Okay? You know because this is such a high pressure when you give it and you take it out and try to enumerate the microorganism they may look like they are dead because they undergo such a shock it may look like, like a almost like a brain dead. Okay? But if you give some nourishment in other words, if you store this product for some time under nutrient rich media, which is like food has all the nutrients, some of these damaged microorganisms, which may be just injured, not really killed, they can slowly recover and then start their activity again. So, they are partially dead, they are not fully dead. Okay? So, therefore, you need to definitely do some challenge studies. You have to inoculate these microorganisms to your product give the process and hold it for maybe a you know one week two weeks whatever under appropriate you know uh, growth conditions and then see if they recover if they don't recover then your process is fine if they do recover you know what you have given is not enough you have to increase the severity of your pressure process okay it's very very essential you know from the safety point of view when you don't have a lot of information okay 
in places where you don't have this kind of information which is a, a new process or a new product then they are called novel okay they are novel products or novel processes novel although now the, in the context of what we are talking about novel is good okay there is a lot of novelty in there from processing point of view novel is a bad news that means regulatory people don't know too much about it if the industry who has to supplement all the data to prove the product is safe it's more of a headache okay if, if the guidelines are already established all that you need to do is follow that up but if that is not there if onus is on you as a company person to demonstrate that the product is safe then only the regulatory people will approve it so therefore people don't want to have that that novel name for associated with the product okay so i mean you, you can't help it if sometimes it's really novel and if they really want to introduce you have to take it trouble to do all those things before it can be released okay okay so we have done a lot of work here and we have you know we have looked at many different products like orange apple mango milk pork meat fish fruit you know there were so many different projects so many different students have worked on it okay we have looked at microbial destruction enzyme inactivation quality change and shelf life extension and so on and so forth okay and more recently we also have looked on work quite a bit on functionality you know like structure and rheology uh so some details we are going to see here in the in the next uh, uh half an hour or so uh related to microbial destruction enzyme inactivation they are all very similar okay so i'm going to explain that for first couple of them and then just kind of show you because it works also for other systems there are thousands of papers on this now okay so it's nothing you know nothing fancy okay just like thermal destruction where you have a d value you can also get pressure d value okay that means time at certain pressure which will inactivate you know one decimal reduction okay of microorganism or enzymes or quality etc okay so the kinetic consideration is very similar to what we do with thermal okay you know you can get uh, d value you can get tdt value then you can do z value now z is related to pressure rather than temperature okay and then uh, in very few cases people have gone rather than d and z people have used non linear kinetic like you know used a weibull and other distribution somebody if you are really going into kinetics you should look into these other non linear regression models for describing this will the the linear models will simply assume a linear destruction kinetic in most cases there is a shoulder in the beginning the destruction goes like this in a sigmoid fashion and there is a tile okay shoulder and tile is not described by the log linear model okay these other models can define the shoulder and also the tile okay so for those things the weibull and logistic and other models are are uh, more useful okay then the second thing we are looking at we are going to look at some pressure shift uh, uh, freezing thawing and uh, as i said uh, brown rice and it's also been used for other applications like densification of wood for example very very effective okay so we we'll look at that you know later okay so in terms of kinetics there's one difference here as compared to conventional destruction kinetic conventional destruction kinetic normally just has this uh, straight line curve okay from which you can get the d value or the decimal reduction time that means when once you start the the treatment time the microorganism starts to the concentration starts to decrease and you get a straight line on a log semi log scale whereas with high pressure there is another step change that's in here which i call a pulse effect okay that means if you simply increase the pressure wait until it reaches the top like a whatever set point pressure and you release it it but that itself can destroy a certain population okay so the magnitude of destruction coming simply by going up and down without the holding time is called pulse effect okay it's effect simply coming from a pressure pulse without any holding time okay and this time basically means is the holding time at a given pressure level so you need to separate this pulse effect in order to get a good regression for the d value 
Okay, so it is a combination of the pressure pulse effect and then the time effect that gives the complete destruction of the microorganism. This is mostly in the case of uh, high pressure you know processing. Okay, after that it is the same thing okay, you get the D value versus pressure and you get the Z P. So, just like D and Z in thermal processing describes the curve here also D and Z can describe the kinetic with pressure also there is a very good parallel between these two, but D, the D value number the minutes are not same pressure D's are much much smaller than thermal D's that is why pressure is more effective in terms of killing bacteria. Okay. Okay, this shows some examples here okay. this is for uh, en enzyme pectin methyl esterase at pH 3.2 and 3.7 in orange juice. Orange juice this is a very powerful enzyme that has to be inactivated for getting a stable you know orange juice. You can see here they are all going through the traditional destruction curve from which you can get the D value okay. as you go higher pressure this is 100 this is 400. So, higher pressure means steeper curve okay, like one below the other remember we were, we were looking at 240, 230 and 250 same thing here so 300, 200, 300 and 400. So, the curves are similar, but the numbers are different. Okay. So, this is pH 3.7 and 3.2 lower pH has more effective killing than a higher pH. Okay. So, you know you can you can destroy much more here as compared to the, the pH 3.7. Okay, so, there is a pH effect there as well. Uh, this shows the pulse effect. Okay. The pulse effect is very small when you are using low pressure levels, but as you increase the pressure level the pulse effect increases. The amount of destruction happening at higher pressure just by a cycle is very high at uh, higher pressures and also it depends on the on the pH. If you have a low pH and higher pressure simply going up and down can almost inactivate 90 percent of the enzyme activity. So, very very attractive because you know the time will be all that you need to do is pressurize which may take maybe 2 minutes 3 minutes and then you release the pressure and the process is complete. Okay. So, it is very effective in that context. Okay. So, pulse effect again depends on the pressure level and the pH condition. Okay. So, this is a very old study 1995 was the very 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 beginning which we did we showed that you know you can extend the shelf life of this uh, orange juice fresh squeezed orange juice to almost 56 days by proper application of the high pressure processing. You know fresh squeezed orange juice is very very perishable if you do not do anything you can only get maybe 3 or 4 days shelf life. So, it has to be sold very very quickly very high quality, but it spoils so fast you have to sell within and sell and use within maximum of 1 week under refrigerator condition. Okay. You pay such a high price you do not want it to spoil. So, if you can use high pressure processing you know you get the same fresh taste but extended shelf life by 8 to 10 you know uh, 7 to 8 weeks of shelf life. Okay, this shows apple juice now polyphenol oxidase in apple juice again similar things. Okay, This is the it adds up a temperature effect as well this is at 25 degrees and this is at uh, 50 degrees. Okay, This is a percent residual activity. Okay, So, it is very high when the, uh, the time is short and the pressure is very low under higher pressure and increased time almost everything is gone. Okay, The whole PPO is very PPO is very resistant, okay, but even that is almost all gone Okay, 99 percent gone at 400 mega Pascals and 20 to 30 minutes of uh, time. If you go to 600 mega Pascals maybe it is going to take only 3 minutes. Okay, So, very very effective in terms of inactivation and this shows the amylase in apple juice okay, which is uh, uh, amylase is very important in apple juice it facilitates filtration amylase will break down the starch and that way filtration is very very easy. Okay. So, and uh, this shows the amylase kinetics in, in apple juice. Okay. Okay. Those are all enzymes okay. pathogens okay. this is E coli E coli O157 H7 this is a pathogenic fecal bacteria okay. very easy to destroy by heat it's more resistant by pressure. See this is the paradox not everything goes the same way as with temperature. Okay. In some cases the one that is more temperature resistant is easy to kill by pressure okay. and something sometimes is temperature is easy, but pressure is more difficult. Okay. So, you know 
So, the, the one of the constraints for high pressure is either Listeria monocytogenous or E. coli O157 H7. So, we need to make sure that we get 5 log reduction in this uh, bacteria in order to make the product safe. Okay? So, which is very easy to do. You, you do something like this and each pressure you can get the D value. You multiply the D value by 5 to give the appropriate treatment that gives you 5 decimal reduction in the product. Okay? And this is Listeria monocytogenes in mango juice. Okay? So, that was uh, uh, this was what the previous one is also mango juice and this is uh, uh, Listeria in mango juice. And uh, this is Listeria, Listeria monocytogenes in milk. Okay, I do not know. It is all screwed up you know, in terms of uh, 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 letters. Okay. This is Listeria here, the bottom one, and the, sorry, the top one is uh, the top one actually is uh, Listeria, and this is natural microflora. So, Listeria, Listerial population was even more resistant than natural vegetative microorganism. Therefore, destruction of natural microflora cannot be taken as an index. You have to inject Listeria monocytogenes and then determine the destruction kinetics. Okay? So, this is to make pasteurization of milk. Okay? So, this again uh, milk with E. coli O157 H7. Again, same type of kinetics, you know, this different pressures and then plot D value versus, uh, versus uh, pressure to get the Z value that completes the, the destruction kinetics stable. So, these are all pretty old data. O early earlier we were only using this for microbial destruction kinetics for different products because at that time not much data were available. So, any new data that you get it was easy you know it's, it always was new and it easy to publish. But today if you try to publish something like this, something like this people say oh you know it is already known. Okay. Everybody knows that it can be used for vegetative bacteria. So, it will be very difficult to publish. Okay. So, as you go more and more as you get more data you have to change your you know strategy for uh, for publication. Okay. This is a uh, little bit difficult to understand. This is microbial destruction under refrigerated and frozen condition. What do you expect? Destruction kinetics. Uh, let us say D value. Uh, normally, when you use temperature thermal treatment, higher the temperature, lower is the D value, right? That means it is easier to kill at higher temperature. Okay? So, now, what do you expect high pressure destruction kinetic doing let us say at room temperature 30 degrees or maybe 5 degrees. Okay? Where do you expect lower D values to be associated with? At 5 degrees, 20 degrees or 40 degrees? Degrees. 30, what is that? 25. 25. Why 25? Why not 40? We are comparing 5, 25 and 40, but why, why 25? Normally, it will be either the, at the low end or at high end, right? In between is really always in between. So, why did you say 25? No, adiabatic heating is everywhere. No matter where you go, whether you do at 5, 5 degrees, 25 or 40, it is a starting temperature okay, as a process temperature. When you pressurize, there is always adiabatic heat, which is the compression, it's just like in the, in the back of the fridge, it is always warm because that is where the compressor is. So, whenever you compress, the temperature increases. Okay? So, whenever you release it, the temperature expansion results in cooling, compression results in heating. Okay? So, in this case, lower temperature actually will give you lower D value. That means, greater destruction at lower temperature, which is difficult to believe. Okay? Normally, higher high, like a higher temperature always results in higher pressures and higher temperatures always result in lower D values or higher kill. Okay? Here, what happens? You are looking at temperature effect and pressure effect. Okay? Now, whether it is 0 degrees, 20 degrees or 40 degrees, the temperature effect is very small because it, this is not lethal level of temperature. So, it is only the pressure effect that we are looking at. Okay? When you go 40 degrees, 
Now, the temperature has expanded the liquid or uh, the, you know to a higher level okay, 40 degrees is higher than 5 degrees. Okay. So, pressure tries to uh, having the having the uh, uh, treatment going at 5 degrees for example, now temperature effect on expansion of the volume is very small. So, everything that you do there is the pressure effect. Okay. So, the pressure uh, pressure component is much higher at 5 degrees. If you go to 40 degrees, the temperature will try to beat the pressure. Okay. In other words, pressure is trying to reduce the volume, temperature is trying to increase the volume. So, there is a contradiction here. Okay. Because of that, the 40 degree can be lower, I can 40 degree can be more uh, 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 higher d value than uh, 5 degree. Okay. But if you go to lethal levels, temperature effects take over and then it is the opposite. Okay. So, that is in this study that is what we are trying to show. Okay. We are doing at you know different temperature and also under frozen condition. Okay. It is difficult to explain all these things here, but if you keep the samples under refrigerated condition the destruction power is higher and if you keep them under frozen condition it is even better okay so the pressure destruction kinetics are even you know better okay so this type of work again is not very easy to do at all all places because you need special equipment in order to do this type of thing okay so anyway it's just to understand it it can it can happen something like that okay one other thing i want to understand here is yeah Sorry. Yeah. The rate of. But we are like in five degree we are getting lowest d value. Yeah. And at forty we are getting a bit more d value. Yeah. At the same pressure. Okay. If you use the same pressure, and then keep the product temperature at five versus forty. rate of destruction increases at lower temperature. It is the reverse of what you see in temperature. Okay, I, I just explained why it is. Okay. The pressure effect at lower temperature is higher if temperature is not contributing to destruction. Here temperature has an effect on the volume, but temperature has no effect on the actual destruction because the lethal effect of temperature is maybe 50 and higher. So, if I increase the temperature, if you increase the temperature further up to 100 degrees, yes, it is a different story. Then temperature and pressure will act together, you know, both the higher temperature and higher pressure, you have lower d value. Okay. So, you have to look at the influence, relative influence of temperature and pressure. Okay. I will I'll come back to this one again when we look at the sterilization, okay, where we are looking at the other end. Okay, right now we are looking at the low end, and we'll also look at the high end later. Okay, that will that will be almost opposite to what I say now. Okay. Okay, this compares the uh, destruction kinetics uh, uh, between enzyme and microorganism. Okay, so you see that enzyme kinetics line is higher than the microbial destruction. That means enzymes are more resistant to pressure destruction than microorganisms. Okay. This may be good news and bad news. Okay. We used it as a good news okay, in some special applications. Okay. That is what I want to highlight in here. Okay. So, when you are making cheese, especially the raw milk cheese, I do not know how many of you heard of raw milk cheese, like cheddar cheese. You know, these are all specialty cheeses, okay. very, very popular in France. Okay. And this has a very strong flavor. These are called smelly cheeses. Okay, those who are not used to cheese, you won't even like it. You know, when you smell, it smells terrible. Okay, just like people who don't like beer. You know, when they when you try to taste beer, it's like, oh, how, how come people like this? Okay, but those who are used to it, they love it. Okay, same thing happens there. Okay, they like it. Okay, and that can only come from raw milk. The minute you pasteurize, you inactivate all these enzymes and they do not develop that flavor. Okay. That flavor only comes from natural, natural milk. Okay. 
and how I can avoid this. Oh, okay, uh, maybe it's something to do with here. Uh, so raw milk cheese has a very very strong flavor, and it ripens faster. Okay, after that, can you come back here for a minute? Um, strong flavor, and also it ripens very very fast. Okay, and this comes mostly from the the native enzymes that are there in the milk. But once you pasteurize, you inactivate all these native enzymes. Therefore, it's not going to be possible there. Okay, so uh, we can use high pressure processing to effectively inactivate the pathogens and not inactivate the enzyme. Okay, raw milk cheese is good. Okay, from flavor and everything. But how many people? How many of you here are willing to drink raw milk? Here, probably your mom says raw milk is good. I mean, people used to go there to the to the dairy and they used to, people used to drink raw milk. Okay. Probably taste better. Probably none of us now know what raw milk tastes like because we, we, we don't drink that anymore. Okay, but it may be very flavorful, very tasty. Okay, with all those frothing, uh, you know, foam and everything, it may be very very tasty. Okay, but it's very unsafe. Okay, because it can potentially have many pathogenic bacteria. So therefore, this process, although it's very popular in in Europe. It's not very popular in North America due to safety restrictions. Okay, so the only way to safeguard this is after you make this cheese, you have to store this cheese at two degrees for almost two months to kill the natural bacteria because they don't tolerate very cold conditions, the pathogens, and therefore they can get, get killed under the acidic condition that is there in the cheese. Okay, so even then, people like in FDA and uh, 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 CFIA in Canada, they did not permit. Okay, so we have to find alternate way of uh, making this. High pressure processing can be a way. Okay, when you use high pressure processing for establishing uh, pasteurization, you kill all the pathogens, but you don't inactivate all the enzymes. Okay, so you treat it, kill pathogens, and then make cheese. You can get very flavorful cheese. Okay, so that's. What we did in this particular uh, in this particular work. Okay, so during the process, we also recognize that high pressure treatment can enhance many other cheese making properties. For example, the coagulation of milk before making cheese. Okay, coagulation can be accelerated by the application of uh, of uh, of uh, 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 pressure. This shows basically how the gel strength of the curd. Is affected by pressure. Okay, both time and pressure actually affects the. If you want a good gel, you have to go minimal time and around you know lower pressure level, like 200 and 10 minutes gives you the best strength for the gel. Okay, it's a combination of time and pressure. Okay, and then again, water holding capacity of the gel is influenced by both pressure and then and uh, holding time. Okay, so again, you can make use of the best. Possible conditions, okay. And then we prepared the milk by four different ways. One is microfiltration for achieving pasteurization. The second one is uh, conventional thermal pasteurization, and the third one is the raw milk. And all these three, four different conditions, are four different ways of high pressure processing, achieving the same level of destruction. Okay, different pressures and temperature time combination, higher pressure. Lower time, lower pressure, longer time, complex. So four different, you know, uh, uh, high pressure processing method. Okay, coagulation time was the least with high pressure process product. Okay, so coagulation time is significantly decreased. Yield of the cheese is much higher in high pressure treated milk for making the cheese. Okay, again an advantage there. Okay, this is the firmness. Firmness of all these high pressure treated cheese were much much better. Than the firmness of the ones starting from either regular pasteurized milk, microfilter fed, or even raw milk. Okay, so therefore, all these conditions basically gave us an indication that you can prepare high-quality raw milk cheese by uh, and safe raw milk cheese by high-pressure treatment. Okay, so we showed that in the first phase. Then we thought, okay, why do you want to treat? Such a big volume of milk to make cheese 
okay because higher volume means more operation time more handling why not we simply treat the cheese with high pressure rather than treating the milk okay so we just use the raw milk we produce the raw milk cheese with all the desirable thing and then we treat the cheese with high pressure yes you can do that also you can inactivate easily the uh, uh, e coli and you can inactivate the pathogenic bacteria o157h7 listeria monocytogenes the destruction kinetics are almost same if I, it's slightly better than in milk because milk pH is lower than sorry the cheese pH is lower than the milk pH okay so this is even better you are only treating maybe 10 percent of the volume rather than the entire you know milk so this is a very very important application you know where we can show that high pressure processing can add significantly to the development of uh, cheese you know uh, especially the raw milk cheese okay so we are going to yeah, this is again another uh, another uh, example uh, showing E. coli uh, again in raw milk cheese. Okay, so these are all just kinetic examples to show different things. Uh, before I finish, I think you can go just one more thing here. This is high pressure processing for tuna fish. Okay, tuna fish is very red, just like salmon. It's a very pink, you know, fish. Okay, and then when once you treat with high pressure, this is the control which is very red, highly red as you treat higher pressures and higher temp time you start changing the color okay at about 220 megapascals after 30 minutes it's already becoming pale pink okay so in terms of market you know somebody would you know if they compare this versus this obviously you buy the, the more red one okay so that's a problem so maybe up to here is still good okay the pink is still there you know but such a mild pressure but even at that condition we could show that the shelf life can be extended by you know from 9 days to 19 days okay so it still has an excellent effect on shelf life extension without drastically changing the color but you would have probably got much better effect for shelf life if you had used maybe 400 megapascals but the color would be all like cooked fish okay cooked salmon okay you know if it is all packaged and you, you only open after cooking further no big deal but if somebody wants to buy it based on the color then you have a problem okay so high pressure is not for everything okay for something it works for something it does not work okay. Uh, so okay just he uh, is not here yet so I will add one more minute here okay these are all different products uh, before and after high pressure treatment okay. So this is meats, okay? All different meats. Every case, you see, the natural color is changed, okay? So for these are all red, you know, generally bright red meats, okay? In all these cases, high pressure processing is no good if color is the important criteria. If you're making a barbecued product, cooked product, no problem. But fresh product, it is a problem, okay? So this is a cured meat. Cured meat is not a problem. This is before and after I can't see any difference okay but it's safe one is much safer the other one is unsafe okay and you have milk before and after strawberries before and after see, they look almost same but this is treated this is untreated okay and here you have cheese before and after again milk before and after and you have beans before and after uh, orange juice before and after tomatoes before and after grapes before and after are in segments before and after okay so in every of these cases the product is very very little different but only the egg only the egg you see something okay egg yolk no problem egg white which was very transparent it became trans like a opaque okay because just like when you cook when you make omelet it becomes white okay so it takes the appearance of heated sample but in most other cases it preserves the natural thing okay so we're going to stop here and then uh, uh, then go for the next one afterwards oh this is almost finished oh, I'm, I'm supposed to take a break and do something and then finish it okay so we have more time okay so any question maybe I went too fast because I didn't want to run into the same problem like yesterday I, I'll, I'll come over later. I can't probably hear.
Paul nur Menschen ist, der will Dinge da unter Verschiedenen, mm -hmm. ah, genau, der Ruf, der Stern wird der Ruf dann verdient. Okay? Now, in faith, the mystery is in the temple, everything comes to party with him. Okay? Now, we have a heavy steel cell that has 25 degrees, and the product has 40 degrees. So, the heat will go from the product to the cell, very quick. So, the temperature comes down, it goes to 40, and then comes down to maybe 32, 31, like that. Okay? Then, you don't know, you know, people say it's just 30 degrees. It's not a 30 degree, it's not a 40 degree. It's going through all these things. So the same together may not be really meaningful at all. But people don't always say this. In early publication, this information is always missing. So when you start getting these things, you know, we made a certain guideline. You have to indicate all these parameters whenever you do kind of experiments. Okay? There are ways of minimizing it. Okay? Let's say you want to do 40 degrees. Okay? And you want to do operate it at 400 megapascals. You know at 400 megapascals, the temperature will go up by 4 degrees, okay? So, what can I do? I want to maintain it at 40. So, I want, I will maintain my cell at 40 degrees if you have a jacketed system, okay? And then I will put my sample at 30 degrees, okay, as I introduce and then lock it up and pressurize. The minute I pressurize, the liquid in the sample will come to 40 and then there's no more exchange because the cell is also at 40, okay? It's very difficult to do, okay? Because 30 degrees will be a different thing. At 30 degrees, you need to start to take a different temperature. A different so everything has a both temperature and pressure dependence. It's in kinetic work is always very, very difficult, but it's doable. It's doable if you understand what is happening. Okay, what's the temperature effect? What's the pressure effect? Okay? Okay. So here we go. Please work for people. So we'll come back in 15 minutes, okay?
It's supposed to go for it's supposed to be going for uh, ninety minutes, so I think okay. uh, can you say anything in forty five minutes? Yeah. Is it forty five minutes from this game or what? Actually No, this is this game is uh, she started at nine thirty. Yeah, she started at nine thirty. Ten thirty would be finished. Okay. So that's more than one hour. Yeah. Ah, okay. So that's not forty five minutes. And the desktop and the this is on. Yeah. Yeah, this slide should have uh, 58. 58 slides. Okay, you can so cover it. Slides. So I can go slow. Yeah, you can go. can go and the lecture which was iske bx for the is in case time is there you can cover that also okay, so that's fine. but i don't want to take time now they will be here till yeah, 1 10 minutes <laughs> actually there is a rush na 1 to 2 they have to go to the hostel take the lunch and then again come back who will be this day everyone may fall okay, apart at least 1 kilometer they have to cycle so okay. that's why okay, can start. Yeah, that's why right, that's the problem. If you start with the day a little later, okay. I thought, but uh, little later, then it would go to six, six thirty. That's why right. the start told to start at two only. Okay. Yeah. So I have uh, finished with all the other. Somebody who's way yeah, but they only told that Ritam should be there, something. Okay, so you're going to...